Hey, John. Hey, Doug. What you doing? Oh, I'm just harvesting likes on Instagram for our evil internet overlords. I'm behind on my quotas this month. If I don't get enough hearts, they're going to delete me. Ooh, that's tough. Remember what life was like before the tech giants took over the world? Yeah, it was great. Free will, going outside, making beer. Too bad everyone started buying online instead of shopping locally, and we were forced into indentured servitude. Yeah, that really was the beginning of the end. Don't let this dark future come to pass. Support your local homebrew shop. Bitterinesters.com Welcome to See What You Can Brew, the podcast about homebrewing, community, and everything beer in New York City. Brought to you by Bitter and Esters in Brooklyn, New York. We're your hosts, Douglas Amport and John LaPola. So on today's show, we talk with Michael Tonsmeyer, not Tonsmeyer, as many people like myself pronounce it incorrectly, who many of you might know as the Mad Fermentationist. We caught up with Michael back at the end of June while we were at HomebrewCon, and he was kind enough to sit down with us to chat about his new brewery, Sapwood Cellars, in Maryland. So before we get to that, I wanted to say a big thank you to everybody who's been listening to the podcast so far. We've had a really great response, and I think there's about 20 people who've actually subscribed. Oh, 20 people. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm not even related to all of them, which is awesome. <laughs> and this is podcast number three, so that's, you know. That's, that's saying right. something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's really great. I mean, we really like doing this podcast. Uh, One thing we'd like to ask you is that you subscribe through iTunes or through Google. We know that a lot of you like to listen to the podcast through our web player on bitterandesters.com, but we're hoping, please, that while you're listening today, you might be able to open up your phone and your heart and subscribe through iTunes or Google Play. It's, it's how they track listens on iTunes, and it's how they you know, determine ratings and stuff. And it makes it actually easier for people to find us if you can do the subscribe button. So if you have already, thank you very much. If you haven't, it'd be super helpful. And just a little more shameless self-promotion. If you could leave a nice review, that'd be even better. So thank <laughs> a you. A nice one. A nice review. A nice sandwich. Pretty please. Thank you. So I thought that since we were discussing the sour program at Sapwood Cellars with Mike Tonsmeyer today, uh, that I would go over the differences between a kettle sour and a barrel aged sour, because we do uh, speak of that several times during the interview, and um, just figured maybe we should refresh people it as to like, what the differences are. It seems like um, a lot of breweries and tap rooms you used to go into, it'd be really hard to find a sour. You know, you, in fact, I think my first sour beer I ever drank was a Flemish red uh, imported from Belgium. It was, it was great. Mine too, actually. And, um, but now you walk into any brewery and it seems like they've got three lychee sours on tap ready to go. <laughs> um, so, so why is that? Well, because there's demand. For sours, that would be the, the first reason, right? Sours uh, and IPAs. Sours and IPAs, and people like sours because they're refreshing. Uh, they say that they're good for people who like wine and not beer, but I think they're also good for people who like beer. Uh, and also, it's a fairly easy for a brewery to make a kettle sour and get it done quickly, as quickly, pretty much as quickly as a uh, their regular beers. So the difference between a kettle sour and a barrel-aged sour is that a kettle sour the brewer will make the wort like they normally would for any beer, bring it to a boil without adding hops because hops, remember, are a uh, preservative. They're antimicrobial, so they stop the souring bacteria from reproducing. So you don't want to add any hops, uh, but they will boil the, the wort to sterilize it and then cool it down to about 100, 110 degrees Fahrenheit and then add some sort of bacteria, usually a lactobacillus bacteria or um, pediococcus, but it's a bacteria that creates lactic acid instead of alcohol as part of its fermentation process. By keeping the wort at about 100, 110 degrees for about 36 to 48 hours, the bacteria will create acid and the pH will drop down to about 3.2 to 3.6, depending on how tart you want the beer to be. Once they're done doing that, bring it back to a boil to kill all that bacteria, dead bacteria. And then you'll boil as usual. Now, you normally won't add a bittering hop because bitter and sour actually are not two flavors that go that well together. So generally, you don't have to boil as long as you normally would because you're really just sanitizing and killing the bacteria. It's really using your hot side to its best effect, yeah. Exactly. But you can add late addition hops for the ar- aromatic properties. Then you would cool your wort down, put it into your fermenter, and pitch yeast as normal. 
You can also dry hop a beer like this because dry hopped sours are quite delicious. The cool thing is that you don't have to worry about contaminating any of your fermentation equipment. So home brewers can do this as well. The big problem with home brewers is having your wort sit for 36 to 48 hours at 100 degrees. I suggest to people to put it into their ovens at 100 degrees. The other thing you want to look out for is not having your wort see any oxygen because oxygen can react with certain bugs that will create vomit-like flavors, butyric mm, flavors. Or foot, so you want delicious to be, or foot, foot flavors. Foot flavors. Yeah. Now, it's, that's a kettle sour. Kettle sours are simple. They, a lot of times they're called simple sour, but they tend to be one note. Uh, they're easy for breweries to get done quick. A lot of times they'll fruit it. Uh, add some fruit during well, fermentation. Yeah, you forget the most important part, John. You got to pour like 80 pounds of lychee fruit and right. like five pounds of salt and some peaches <laughs> in there, maybe some raspberries. Doug absolutely loves salted sours a lot. Yeah. Yeah, it's my least favorite style. You'll see Michael talks about this. You can have many different flavors that you can make from one wort basically, uh, depending on how you ferment it and how you add your fruit and what fruits that you add. So they're simple turnarounds. But the traditional way of actually making a sour is to make your wort, again, uh, low IBU, and then put it into a fermenter or a barrel or something and pitch your yeast and your bacteria. Uh, you can use Brettanomyces yeast uh, and let it just sit because at the cooler temperature, it takes a lot longer for the souring to happen. And what happens here is you get more complex flavors. You'll get flavors from the wood if you're putting it into a barrel. You'll get flavors from the, the bread, from the different yeasts that you're using. So it's a more complex thing. Both simple sours and barrel-aged sours can be blended if uh, you feel that they're either too tart or if you just want to get different flavors. But the barrel-aged sours are almost always blended in some way because of the fact that they've been sitting <laughs> for a year to three years and you don't know exactly what you're getting at the end. Well, uh, I mean, when you get when you let something sit for that long, it gets a little bit weird and it's really nice to add some of the some of the younger beer into it. So, right. I mean, these barrel aged sours are for at least for a home brewer are an epic project. Yeah. And I mean, most of the, most breweries that I know that do long term sours have a separate location where they go put all their barrels, you know, in a nice cheap neighborhood. And <laughs> right, yeah, <laughs> right. Well, just you know leave what? them and just leave them. Let them. Sit Although forever. leave some in the brewery because they look really cool. <laughs> you have all yeah. those barrels uh, stacked up, and uh, barrel aging isn't always souring. Barrel aging can be just for the whiskey or wine mm -hmm. effects that you can get from the type of barrel you're having. All right. So before we get on to the interview, I just wanted to add one more thing. Uh, we've got a yeast class coming up here at Bitter and Esters on August 11th at noon. Um, and if you've never been to a yeast class, they're a lot of fun. Actually, we do a two-hour lecture. And then there is a tasting where we've got eight different beers uh, brewed from the same wort, uh, same hopping, same everything, except we've pitched a different yeast strain into each of the beers. So you get to taste eight beers side by side, and the only difference, they've been, all been fermented at the same temperature in the same room right next to each other, and the only difference is the, the yeast. So it's really edifying. It's really educational. It's actually a really great way to learn the differences between yeast. Yeast flavor is 80 to 90% of your beer. So earlier, when I was thinking about this episode and our interview with Michael Tonsmeyer, we drank, um, what was it? Sip Sap. Snip Snap. Snip Snap. Snip Snap. We drank, we drank a, a Northeast IPA while we were talking with Michael, um, and it made me really want some Northeast IPA when I was thinking about this last night. So I went over to Fifth Hammer and picked up Sonic Architecture, and it's got Idaho Gem mosaic and huel melon and i've never had idaho gem i'm trying to figure out which flavor in the beer is that pacific that is. gem and idaho seven hybrid i mean that would be the thing i would think be, it was that'd be my first guess i've never had it before but i've got the i, I can definitely taste the strawberries in here and mosaic is super obvious yeah um, mosaic comes right up your nose the silence is us drinking. Yes, it's 11 in the morning. We figured that uh, it's a good idea to drink while doing the podcast. Especially a 7.5% IPA. Right. Is it really that high? It's 7.5%. Yeah, it doesn't. It's, again, these, these beers do not taste the alcohol the way, the way they should. And for those of you who are listening from somewhere that's not New York City, Fifth Hammer is an awesome brewery in Long Island City, Queens. It is owned by two of our good friends, Chris and Mary, and you should definitely check them out. You should check out all of Long Island City, Queens breweries if you well, have a chance. There's five or is six it? breweries up yeah, there Yeah, and it's, they're yeah. all within two miles of each other, so it makes for a really great uh, little brewery tour. So Michael Tonsmeyer, a.k.a. the Mad Fermentationist. 
Michael is the ultimate home brewer gone pro. I was thinking this when I was listening to the interview. I was thinking, you know, we always talk about home brewers going pro, but mm-hmm. Michael had, has the Mad Fermentationist blog. He, he was doing consulting for Modern Times. Uh, he's just a, a well-known home brewer. I mean, and he, mm-hmm. he had a job, and he was never thinking of going pro, and then he decides to go pro. So to me, it was if he made that leap, if he, after everything he knew and everything he saw, he made the leap. It's like, well, you know. There must be something there to must this. must be something to this. Yeah. yeah. And, and we talk with him a lot about that, about changing his lifestyle and changing everything he's doing. And he's making great stuff. He opened it with Scott Janish, who also has a, a blog. He's mm-hmm. uh, just recently wrote a, a book on IPAs as well. But uh, the discussion is all about opening a brewery, which was fascinating. Uh, hazy IPAs, <laughs> if you want to hear about it. Hazy so IPAs and sours, right? And their sour beer program. Mm-hmm. So take cool. it away, Michael. You know what's the first question I want to ask you, Michael, is how do you pronounce your last name? Tonsmeyer. Sometimes uh, I, I've heard Tonsmeyer. Yes. Uh, so I had an uncle who stopped pronouncing it Tonsmeyer and just went with Tonsmeyer because so many people <laughs> said it that way. He just gave up. This is our first interview. So this is our this is our first interview uh, with Michael Tonsmeyer here at Tonsmeyer. <laughs> 2019. Okay, uh, yeah, we're at Homebrew Con. All right, so you have been to our store. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was about uh, three or four years ago when you uh, first released the Sour Book, and at that time, I had asked you about Modern Times. You were you were doing consulting for them, I believe. Yeah, I, I worked for Modern Times for maybe two or two and a half years from. Uh, right when Jacob was leaving Stone to start the brewery until probably uh, a year after uh, they'd been open. Um, But sort of, uh, I did test batch brewing for them at home in uh, in D.C., which is weird now because you can get Modern Times beer in Maryland and D.C. And uh, then I went out there for a summer right after they opened to um, help dial in recipes and start the sour program, build up some cultures and go to events and those sorts of things. Now, if I remember correctly, I think I asked you, hey, you have a day job. Yeah. I was an economist for the Bureau of Labor Statistics for about uh, 11 years. And I had asked you about working full-time in the beer thing, and yeah. you said no. So what happened? Uh, I, I uh, drank too much of my friend Scott Janish's homebrew and, <laughs> and uh, told him, we, oh, hey, if you're ever looking to open a brewery or something, we should, we should talk. And he said, yeah, you know, actually, I've been poking around at it. Let's talk about it. <laughs> and so that was, that was the, the start of it at what HomebrewCon in Baltimore, about, was that two years ago or three years three, ago? I think three, three years ago was when we really started seriously talking about it and um, just finally opened uh, last September. Is that all you're doing? Yeah, you just... I, I, I quit my day job at the BLS about a month before we started brewing. Just there was enough, enough stuff and it seemed like things were going to go smoothly enough at that point that it was worth stepping away and not paying someone else to do a job that I could do that I would care more about. Well, congratulations. Congratulations. What was the biggest and what was the biggest mental hurdle in your mind that, that made you not want to do it? And then what got rid of that hurdle for you? I, a big part of it is that um, the beer industry, I think, has really changed. And the things I love about brewing, the creativity and doing different things and experimenting has almost become a requirement to be a brewery that people are excited about. Um, just five or six years ago, you know, Modern Times opened with four core beers, and the whole idea was like, well, we're not going to have an IPA because there are so many great IPAs already in San Diego. And you, you, how are you going to compete as a new brewery against Alpine, Alesmith, Stone, Port Brewing, probably five or six of the best IPA breweries in the world. Yeah, so we yeah. opened with a Hoppy Amber and a Hoppy Wheat Beer and a 100% Bread IPA. And very quickly within a year, we realize that, like, just the more IPAs, the better. And so now Modern Times does, you know, I think they have a quarterly series of IPAs in addition to monthly special release IPAs, in addition to, you know, year-round IPAs. The hoppy beer is not going anywhere, particularly pale, bright, juicy, whatever hoppy beer is, is here to stay. And having been a home brewer for, for 10 or 12 years, I think is a bigger leg up than having worked as a cellarman or work production at a large brewery because – Right now, what people want is new things every time they come in. You need to entice people in with, hey, if you're not here this week to try this new beer, this variant, you're never going to have it. So how did you take that lesson and apply it? How did you apply it on Snapwood? Um, Snapwood. Snapwood. I'm sorry. (laughs) Oh, my God. We are at HomebrewCon, just... I'm the the triple I had It is 105 p.m. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Snapwood. 
Yeah, so it's we we don't have core beers. We do not always make the same beer. When we opened, we didn't say, well, you know, these are the beers we'll brew again. There were beers that we had opening day that we've rebrewed two or three times, and there are beers that were we did once and have not returned, or we reimagined and completely changed and have rebrewed under a different name. I, I think we're in an age of specialization. Mm-hmm. Um, the only way we can survive with 7,000, 8,000, 10,000 breweries in the country, not to mention imports, not to mention sub-brands. I mean, that's, a lot of these big breweries now have you know, sub-brands that they're doing. Well, we'll never do an IPA until we make a side venture that only does IPAs mm-hmm. or whatever it mm-hmm. is. To me, I look at it like restaurants. I mean, we have, I think it's something like 50 or 100,000 restaurants in the country because not everyone does the exact same thing. They're not fighting over the same consumers. They have different price points. They have different specializations. They get equipment that's, you know, you're a pizza restaurant. You get the big brick oven. You hire people who know how to make pizza. You specialize in getting ingredients and, and figure out how to put ingredients together for the pizza and making your own sauce. And you don't try to make Chinese food or sushi or... A traditional Brazilian barbecue in the same way I think too many breweries try to be everybody's brewery. And for us, it's okay if somebody comes in and says, I really want a Bud Light, what do you have that's like that? We're not mean about it. We, we'll say, hey, we've got this low-gravity wheat beer. It's you know, low bitterness. You might you know, have, have, a, have a free taste, see if you enjoy it. But if they say, eh, it's not for me, I really like a pale lager, we're not the brewery for you. Mm-hmm. Is there a core philosophy? Yeah, so it really for us at, at this point, it's hoppy beer and sour beer. And we dabble in some other things a little bit. In the winter, we'll have a stout or two that we'll brew. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not against stouts by any mean, but sort of the focus is like making the best hazy, hoppy, juicy IPAs. Um, and so we've gotten equipment that's good for that. We've done subtle variations. So even like we'll have a new beer and it'll be very much similar to the last batch of pale ale that was dry hopped with citra, and this one's dry hopped with mosaic. We're learning a lot. We are still experimenting sort of on the edges, or hey, we'll take that beer that we really liked with Y East London 3, and we'll ferment it with a Conan variant. And so, same hop, same malt, and just change that one variable, give it a new name. So it sounds a little bit like you're also trying to be a bit educational to the consumer. Like if you're just changing one ingredient, yeah. do, you, do you point that out to them? Like this is a different yeast of the beer you might have had before. We've we've uh, been told by our bar manager that uh, talking about yeast strains does not get people excited. <laughs> um, and that's <laughs> who are these what? people? Who are these people? <laughs> yeah, no. Sa- sadly, um, most of the people who drink beer are not home brewers and and aren't particularly excited to know about the process or the microbes involved and it's it's super great when once or twice a week we'll be in there on Saturday and someone will come in and, and talk to one of the bartenders and they'll come back and they'll say hey somebody's here from Georgia who wants to talk to you or hey there's somebody who was you know passing through you know moving across country and they you know detoured or whatever um, but most of the people that come in just are local and want to try good beer and that's sort of it and we we certainly are more descriptive about what we're doing but that's not <clears throat> We try to focus on flavors and, you know, not talk about the fermentation, but talk about the house culture that produced this interesting stone fruit flavor. Um, and in the long run, that's all that matters is whether people are going to drink the damn thing. And yeah. Like it, right? Yeah. And, and, and I'm happy to talk to if a home brewer comes in and wants to talk shop, I'm happy to. But I, I think a lot of wineries uh, get it a lot more right that the focus is on the flavors, not necessarily on the um, compounds that were involved or the specific harvest point and what level of you know tartaric acid they were looking for whatever it is they the back of the label is about the bucolic landscape and about the juicy red fruit flavor you know whatever <laughs> right. whatever it is i'm psyched about tartaric acid yeah. i don't know about you i like the acid additions excite me so i guess i have a question about your sour program mm-hmm. and sort of what i mean you have this infrastructure now you're no longer home brewing how does that change your outlook on sours like if you're making 30 how big is your brew house 10, 10 you're, if you're making 10 barrels of something dumping that if you make a mistake is a much bigger deal than five gallon batch it's it's actually in a way it's less risky because with that single 10 barrel batch which takes just about as long as a, a 10 gallon batch that i used to do at home i can get five oak barrels out of that and each of those can get a different culture I don't want that one house culture that makes everything taste exactly the same, even if it's reliable and it gets the acid on time. I'd rather have one barrel that I had to dump because it wasn't good and one barrel that's just perfect that can be served on its own and one that's a little too sour and one that's not sour enough or one that would be good with fruit or one that would be good with dry hopping. Or We're intentionally trying to build in variability through microbe choice, through barrel selection, through aging time, all those okay. things to yeah. give us an opportunity to blend. 
And again, it's also about learning. You know, mm-hmm. that we can have four or seven of Blanc barrels with, with our house saison culture in it, but then each one got extra bread. And hey, we've now learned something about each of those cultures and what which ones we like or hey, that was fun, that maybe was a good component, but it's not something we want to use again in um, one of our beers. That's, that's really interesting. I, I, I guess, and I'm getting a little bit in the weeds, so sure. we can stop this line of conversation whenever we oh, no, board I'm, or I'm, sober I'm always up. happy to talk to okay. talk shop with people who are interested in it. It's just something right. that the average consumer is not. I guess what I'm interested in, too, is like timing. Like, you know, kettle sours, that's, they're great, they're interesting, but they're not as complex, they're not as interesting. And I know a lot of the experiments that I've heard about on your blog talk about like the older the longer fermentations the longer sour beers how does that play into the like the economics of your business the barrel aging like how do you how do you factor for that and then how do you deal with it i i'm always amazed by places like de and rare barrel that mm-hmm. that is a hundred percent of their business is essentially long-term barrel age large format bottle it didn't make sense for us where we are we're you know in a, a relatively populous area that has relatively high rents. And so we wanted to get some beer that was very sooner. So I mean, partly that was the IPAs and mm-hmm. things are a quick turnaround and obviously very popular right now. Yeah. We actually just did our first kettle sour, but we've been doing relatively quick mixed fermentations, low IBU, big pitcher lacto, and then um, whatever, you know, maybe 100% brett, maybe a mixed fermentation. We started out with just a, a plain Berliner Weiss, no boil, with brett, uh, keg condition, naturally with sugar, was our way of saying to people in Maryland where there aren't a lot of non-fruited, non-juicy, um, um, non-vanilla, non-lactose sour beers. There, mm. there are some, there's some pretty good ones, but there are not a lot of them. Um, that like, hey, sour beer isn't just fruit juice. And we had people coming in that was like, hey, I'd like to try your sour, you know, I, I like sour beer and, and having that just going, well, you know, what is this? You know, where's the fruit? Where's the where's the vanilla? Where's the... Yeah. Um, and we've, we have done some... Fruited ones, we tend to go for like Oregon fruit purees just because they're super reasonably priced and we can sell a, a 14 ounce pour of, you know, two pounds per, per gallon of apricot, whatever, for seven bucks, oh, that's great. which yeah. is, you know, again, it's not going to be as complex, but if you're hitting something with, with those real high fruiting levels, I'm not sure you're going to taste much of the barrel and the fermentation and the, I don't mind doing good barrel-aged beer with fresh local fruit that's going to have an interesting flavor at a moderate level that's going to highlight something and, and it's going to add complexity to maybe a barrel that wasn't our favorite one. I'd never add fruit to a to a bad beer to try to cover it up, but a beer that's just not very exciting, maybe the acidity's not there, the fruit's going to feed the microbes, it's going to um, bring some of its acidity of its own. But that's to me, that's part of the magic of blending. Blending isn't just um, having four beers and, and picking the ones that go together into a blend. It's deciding which one gets dry hopped, which one gets fruit, what gets blended, what gets saved to next year to be blended into something else. I'm really looking forward to um, have enough barrel aged beer that we can take 60 gallons of a mixed fermented golden sour and, and blending into 300 gallons of fresh saison. And having a beer that has some barrel age, some, some extended funky kind of flavors with a fresh, vibrant, you know, maltiness, hoppiness, whatever. Just having those options available is great. But yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see, we just bottled our first um, uh, Sauvignon Blanc barrel age Saison. How, so long, how long did it age? It was in the barrel, so it was well, basically the first beer we really brewed back in August. Uh, we put it in barrels early September, and we just bottled it in early June. That's awesome. So, was that nine months? Yeah. Close to nine months? Which is about right, particularly first use barrels um, were pretty punchy, and it was primary for me with Brett, and then each barrel got additional Brett, so it was pretty funky. Um, and again, it, it's it's not the kind of beer that is immediately going to get people super excited. People love the you know again the heavily fruited, big, bright, juicy, sweet, sour kind of thing. But we just want to say like, hey, like there's a range, um, and the real goal is eventually to build up a, a nice bottle list of maybe ten bottles available at any time. That we have great bartenders and they can kind of walk people through. Okay, you like sour beer. How sour do you like beer? You know, are we talking, you know, rip rip your enamel off, or are we talking lightly tart, bright, refreshing? Um, and to have it be a real experience. Um, and you'll have them all. Yeah. And and that we'll hang on to bottles and then you know have vintage balls so that next summer when we do the second batch of the cherry beer, for an extra two bucks you could try last year's. Last year, and then you might be able to say, yeah wow, that's great with a year on it. I'm going to buy an extra bottle, drink one now, save one for next year, or 
wow, okay, I guess I should just drink my bottle now because, <laughs> you know, the, the cherry flavor is so bright and fresh right now. And I don't want to see it, you know, fade away. And on the other hand, you do IPAs. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. it's 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 hard not to do IPAs at this point. I mean, I, I know there are some breweries that, that have always refused. I, I've never been someone to say, I will never mm -hmm. anything. I, I don't do a lot of kettle sours. I don't use a lot of what we have yet to use, like a, a quote unquote natural flavoring with, with just unreal ingredients. But I'm never going to be someone who says, if you do that, you're wrong, or I will never do that. It's an abomination because... The goal is to make really good beer. I, this is not a, I'm not making a political statement by, by selling beer. I'm trying to make good beer that people enjoy. And I could imagine a situation where a beer that I had real coconut to wasn't as coconutty as I wanted. And just adding a little bit of, of coconut flavoring might be that little boost that it needs. And I don't want to then have to like, you know, hide that fact <laughs> or be, you know. Right. It's very much what happened with some brewers with New England IPA. There were some brewers who had early versions of it, or maybe had a bad pour of it, or you know whatever, and said, these beers are, are wrong, the people brewing them are not good brewers, anyone who enjoys these beers doesn't know what they're talking about. And now you see a lot of those brewers making hazy beers because that's what people demand, and now they get it, and, and I've heard people who are apologetic about what they said early on, or you know, you have a social media post and you don't expect it to go where it goes, yeah. but I don't begrudge anyone for making beer that people enjoy. So wow. tell us about this beer. This is delicious. One of the better beers I've had, actually, in a little while. Yeah, thank you. This is the, this is, uh, the beer that we've sort of gotten the most excitement for. Um, Snip Snap is a... Thank you. Oh, sorry. sorry. Move my glass. There you go. It's, it's held up okay. This was canned um, a little more than a month ago, I think. It's a Citra Galaxy IPA. And there's... It's just one of those magical hop combinations. There's something about Galaxy that makes the beer super cloudy. This beer had Whirl Flock. This beer had, really? um, we, we had uh, Biofine Clear, the, the, the finding agent. Um, I mean, even after a, a month in the can, I mean, you can take a peek in there. There's nothing in there. There's no yeast right. sludge. Um, I'm, I'm friends with. Um, and it's opaque. Yeah. Like just, just to say, because we're so on a podcast. The best hazy IPAs don't have sludge in them. They don't have hop particulate in them. They don't have yeast in them. Um, a lot of the big breweries, um, I, I was just hanging out with JC from Trillium last night. They have a centrifuge. Other half has a centrifuge. Yeah. They spin out all the solid stuff in their beers. They're still plenty plenty hazy. Um, you know, it increases their yield. It, it helps them get a, a marketable product faster. It cleans up the flavor. It doesn't have that harsh lingering bitterness that, that some um, IPAs that have the sort of can sludge have. I'm t I'm totally digging this. So one thing I find with Galaxy though is a single single hop Galaxy beers don't do it for me. It, 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 I always say it needs a friend. Yeah. A single mosaic is fine. A single citra is fine. Yeah. But uh, Galaxy, I don't know. It doesn't. And so once you add that other one, both of them yeah. kind of uh, yeah take off. Our, our, our bar manager uh, Spencer, who's who's a longtime home brewer too, that's exactly what he says that. If you've got a bunch of Galaxy, don't make one Galaxy beer that's all Galaxy. Make two beers, one that's, <laughs> you know, Galaxy Citra and one that's Galaxy something else. We're doing a Galaxy Nelson IPA yeah. soon. Good. Is Scott more the uh, IPA guy? He's certainly nerdier about it. I mean, I, I did my first hazy IPA, I think, five years ago. So I, I'm certainly not new to this. Um, it always made sense to me as a home brewer because for a long time you couldn't really get really fresh, great, hoppy beer easily. So much of the IPA that you buy on the supermarket shelf or the liquor shelf is old, older than it should be, is mistreated, is whatever. And so bringing it home where you have total control over it, it's as fresh as possible, it's never been warm, is a, a worthwhile thing to do. Like now there's just so much good hoppy beer out there. You know, sort of the code has been cracked that I don't know. You, know, you can get a good New England IPA anywhere. Last time I was in San Diego, it was hard to find a West Coast IPA. <laughs> it happened to me in San Francisco. And they're like, oh, everything's a uh, New England yeah. IPA. I'm like, come on, guys. You guys make <laughs> these amazing IPAs. We, we did one um, sort of West Coast leaning IPA. We did Columbus and Simcoe in the boil. And we dry hopped with um, Simcoe and Strata, which is a relatively new variety that's a little danker. Um, I think Indie Hops is sort of the primary grower of it. Um, and it just it didn't sell super well. Like people were just it wasn't even that clear. It was sort of clear ish. Um, and that one, I mean, same thing. It was 100 percent malted barley. We added not only Wolf Lock and 
uh, BioFine, but we also had um, Clarity Firm or Clarex or whatever, the gluten chopping, mm -hmm. chill haze preventing one. But with those heavy dry hopping rates with high oil hops, you still get a decent amount of haze. I mean, um, that's the, not poly the polyphenols or is it the oils? Uh, Scott Scott would be able to answer that better. It, it, it My understanding is an interaction between the proteins from the malt and polyphenols and other compounds from the hops. And so it, it can rely on how much um, protein you have initially. It can, it can rely on different yeasts uh, leave different amounts of protein in suspension. Some of them, in my understanding, is in their flocculation will pull some of that stuff out. And so how much of that's available when you dry hop is sort of a big determinant, which is one reason dry hopping very early in fermentation can lead to more um, haze because it's sort of before the yeast has dropped out, so you still have more of those proteins available for, for linking and whatever. Yeah, but I mean, it's just sort of the, the market has moved towards the, the hazier, juicier, lower bitterness, very approachable flavors, very welcoming, you know, reminiscent. Scott always uses candy descriptors for, <laughs> yeah. he's always, I, he doesn't eat a lot of candy as far as I've ever seen, but he's always <laughs> saying this tastes like green jelly beans or this tastes like, you know, pink, pink now and laters or whatever it is. He's got the dark candy past. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. Do you, do you still homebrew? I have not homebrewed recently. I, 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 my gear is now at the brewery just because it makes more sense if I'm going to do something just to do something there and so I could, I could put it on tap at the brewery if I wanted to. It's also so much easier with like an on-demand hot water heater that can go up to 180 <laughs> degrees and a pad I can spray things down. Um, honestly, the last homebrew scale batch I did was I did a YouTube video where I recorded the process for Snip Snap and then I homebrewed, I saved some of each ingredient, and I homebrewed the exact same recipe, scaled exactly without trying to compensate for the scale. And then we put them on tap next to each other and served them to, be, to people blind and said, hey, which do you prefer? And? Um, the, the commercial beer ended up, the commercial scale one ended up better rated. Um, a lot of that was just that time sort of flew on me, and we just sort of shook carb the uh, homebrew one. Like two days before, it was a little undercarbed. It was also a little bit um, rougher hot bitterness because it didn't have that time in the bright tank like the big one did before it went into kegs to settle out and sort of clarify. And, and I have one other question. When we first came in here, you said, oh, I have uh, some Sips app. It's old. Yeah. It's a month old. Uh, do you really consider that old? Because I, I know it's um, fantastic. I, it tastes fantastic. I mean, and I know that I can only it's, imagine it's how good it's, it was. It's the, to me, I, I get a little, um, just a little old flavor in the maltiness. Okay. Um, we contract brew our cans, and the it's held up pretty well. It's just not not like kegging. Kegging is every, you know, we, we triple purge the kegs. It's all, you know, in there under pressure. And canning, even, they've got a nice canning line. I and mean, those cans, you know, slide through. You know, they get filled. There's a little bit of time there where there's a CO2 blanket, but the lid isn't on yet. Um, and they start going downhill. Mm. Um, From within, oxidation? Yeah. It's not terribly oxidized. It's it's been a. Fl I've always been ultra sensitive to it. There are other flavors that I can't taste at all, but old hoppy beers just it's it's a dullness to the flavor. It's a it's not papery. It's not cardboardy. We've been super happy with the beers uh, that that they've done for us, and we've got another. Uh, we do a series called Cheater Hops that the Scott and I have had a running joke for a long time that it doesn't take any skill to make a Citra Galaxy beer or a Nelson Mosaic beer or. It's, it's just like cheating. If you can make a great New England IPA with Columbus and Centennial and, you know, Saws. Cascade, exactly. That's like, that is real, like that takes real skill. Dry hopping something like this with hops that already smell and taste so good is 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 easy. Um, and so we're, we're doing a Nelson Mosaic Azaka beer. And there's some debate whether Azaka really counts as a cheater hop or not. It's so. pretty close. Yeah. yeah. yeah um, it's, it's, right, it's right, like Idaho 7, there are a couple of those that are like right on the cusp. They're not just like... Well, on its own, it would make a great beer, but um, we do a beer called Pillow Fort. It's another double IPA that's Citra Azaka that's one of our, our more popular beers. So, Can you can you explain to me the logo? I mean, I, I've, the, I've been... You know, the the with the Sapwood with Sellers logo. The, well, the image, where did it come from? How'd you... It's, it's a, a hop, half hop, yeah, we, half We call acorn? it a hop corn. Hop corn. Hop corn. Yeah. Half acorn. Yeah. 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 Um, so the, it's it's sort of because there's there's Scott and I and sort of I mean obviously like he just wrote um, a book about hoppy beers He's, his blog was mainly focused on hoppy beer so half a hop and then the acorn is um, for the sour side um, acorns grow into oak trees oak trees make barrels gotcha um, the logo itself was done by a guy who uh, was a recent graduate of uh, MICA the Maryland Institute Design College um, and we just put a thing out on their job board that said hey if you're a graphic designer we're starting a brewery. 
send us your resume, send us you know your portfolio. Um, we picked a few people and we said, hey, for I forget it was 100, 200 bucks, come up with something, pitch, pitch us your idea. Um, we picked the one that was our favorite and then we gave him more money to finalize it, tweak it, give us the high res images, those sorts of things. Cool. What do you think you personally are tired of and what are you excited for? I have always been a person that hoppy beer was rarely something to go way out of my way for because people have cracked the code. If, you, if it's a fresh beer loaded with, again, Citra, Mosaic, Galaxy, Amarillo, whatever, and it's well-made, it's going to be a good beer. Um, but to me, sour beers are, are so much more interesting because you can have the five best sour beers in the country by whatever metric you want, and they're going to be completely different. They're going to have different levels of acidity. They're going to have different volatile compounds. People are using local fruit. So even if you get two cherry sours, one with Michigan cherries, one with Maryland cherries, they're going to have different flavor profiles. And people are going to use different barrels. And there's going to be different blending palettes. And, and so to me, that's always been a lot more interesting and exciting. Um, I, I, I've had a hard time. I, I love the foraging stuff. Um, but the, the TTB, you have to get uh, recipe approval and it, I'm not sure what other people are doing because they I, they have not wanted me to do acorns. I haven't been able to do uh, local juniper. I don't know if other people like if there's some magic combination of words that makes them approve these things. But like that's it's killed me that like I can't do like those things are a lot more fun and interesting to me. New mm -hmm. ingredients. I did a sumac beer last year that I was super excited about and was really like had this like crazy Hawaiian punch flavor. Like fresh staghorn sumac, yeah. Oh. Scratch Brewing in, in Ava, Illinois yeah. is such such an inspiration. I got to go there last, so I guess it was two falls ago now. Um, just, I mean, so fantastic. So many flavors, so much um, thoughtfulness that went into their beers that just, um, I, I agree, like chocolate, coconut, you know, Imperial Stout's delicious, but also anyone can do it um, pretty easily. Whereas, you know, fermenting acorns for two years before you add them to the beer is, I mean, I guess technically anyone could do it, but like <laughs> it takes such specialized knowledge on on you know how long to dry them and how to store them and what to look for on the acorns and when you have to go out there and yeah and they they just had so many amazing beers. Um, Marka, the head brewer, is just her and Aaron, who's their um, their forager. Just um, if anyone hasn't read the Homebrewers Almanac, their book is is fantastic. It's it's by far my favorite homebrewing book that I've I've ever read. Do you miss being an economist at all now that you're? Uh... You're doing the brewery? I, I wouldn't say I miss being an economist. I mean, I, I miss getting home at 5 o'clock and not having to, to do anything or think about anything uh, until the weekend's over. Right now, it's I get calls on Saturday night. Hey, the, the, the plumbing's backed up at the brewery. Should we close the tasting room? Hey, um, you know, the farmer's not showing up when he's supposed to. You know, is, is, you know, is there a backup farmer? I wouldn't say that I miss it. It's a very different lifestyle, a very different rhythm to my life now than it used to be i mean it, i'm i'm gone for 12 hours six days a week usually and then on sundays i'm usually writing for something or working on taxes or whatever and we're still early in this and you know part of that is scrimping and saving now so we can rather than paying someone we can save up to buy more equipment or more tanks or more whatever to to make it more feasible but we're lucky the response has been great so far, and, and I we haven't had sort of that. We, we didn't take out loans. We don't have big, like, financial pressures or investors who are breathing down our necks. And being in Maryland, it's just, it's it's not nearly as competitive as being in, you know, San Diego that has 200 breweries in San Diego County, and we have 100 in the entire state of Maryland. And so there's there's some breathing room there, and, and the other local brewers have been super supportive. And, you know, we've done a bunch of collaborations and been, you know, do events with them and it's been good so far. It, it's sort of what I expected. It's a lot of hard work. It is uh, rewarding, but also it's frustrating and, and stressful. You know, we we just dry hopped. We we did um, we had four barrels of Sauvignon Blanc saison. We blended two and a half of them, balled it off. That went smoothly. We par carbed it. We primed it. Bottles seemed to be carbonated after two weeks. Could use a little bit more carbonation, but you know, if they're not exploding and they're not flat. Uh, and then another one and a half oak barrels went into the blending tank with a whole bunch of Nelson Savin figured Sauvignon Blanc barrel, Nelson Savin hops. We purged it. It just doesn't taste right. It's maybe it's oxidation. Maybe it's just some sort of weird hop interaction. But now it's like, man, you know, well, there there goes, you know, $400 worth of Nelson Savin and potentially, you know, a barrel and I mean, I guess technically three, three barrels of, of beer. And like, hopefully it, it fixes itself, but it's like, well, is it worth kegging off? Is it worth bottling? You know, it might, 
maybe, maybe we're just getting some weird flavor and maybe it'll, it, it'll clean up. I mean, it shouldn't be oxidized. It's transferred under pressure. It's in a sealed vessel with CO2. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's just like it's, it's a different level of disappointment than like, oh, man, that five gallon carboy got a little oxidized. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I'd rather dump beer that was eh rather than, you know, sell it. Right. You sound like a business owner. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Michael. Thank you so much, Michael. And thanks for the beer, man. Yeah, of course. Uh, glad, uh, glad, down with glad you enjoyed. Good to see you guys again. It's good to see you too, man. So I really liked that interview. That I was remember a great interview. I, I was pretty a little tipsy during that one, I think. I think calling it an interview is loose. It's a it loose, was, yeah, it's yeah, a loose it definition of, a, of an interview. It was more of a conversation and hanging out with our friend Mike. He's such a great guy. That's, you know, yeah. he's so easy to get along with. Just a regular dude. He's huh. and um he brought beer for us. He brought just, beer for really us. Sweet. I was I was yeah, so was really happy nice. about that. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. That was very cool. So we should wrap up here, but I wanted to mention that we have a website, bit, uh, bitterandesters.com, which is our business. It's where we sell things from. You can find the blog there and, and links to iTunes and Google Play to please, please, please subscribe. Uh, we also have a website for the podcast itself, seewhatyoucanbrew.com. We'll probably do all the Facebooks and things here in the next few weeks and months. Um, I'm, just, I'm just not super social media anymore. <laughs> and I am. John is, yeah. Oh, and one other note. So we've got so in our very first podcast, we talked with um, we talked a lot about uh, experiment done by Fermentis, and John just got the PowerPoint uh, finally from from them. So from we, Gabriella at Fermentis. So we can put that up. We'll put that up on see what you can brew and bitterandesters dot com. So you guys can look at that if you go back and listen to that podcast. It really it shows you why you should just put dry yeast directly into your beer. Yeah, yeah. It's a bunch of graphs and charts. Yeah, I've started using a lot more dry yeast. Yeah, me too, actually. Okay. It's cheaper, and you get a lot of stuff out of it, but it's just not, better. not so many uh, strains available, but it's still really mm-hmm. good stuff. Um, anything else, John? Yeah, I'd just like to thank every, everyone who's been listening for listening to this point. Oh, yeah, um, thank you. We do appreciate it, and we appreciate everyone who supports our business, and we'll see you in two weeks. Till next time. Till next time. <laughs> to sit in solemn silence on a dull, dark dock in a pestilential prison with a lifelong lock, awaiting the sensation of a short, sharp shock from a chip and cheery chopper on a big black block. Big black block, short, sharp shock. Awaiting the sensation of, yeah, you, you can just go on, you can just do it for, for minutes. That's a new one for me. No, you've never heard that one? No. You didn't record that, did you? Yes, I did. Ha ha! To sit and tell a